we are about the time, and so I think we will uh, get going slowly, but uh, with a small introduction so that uh, the last people can find their <coughs> seats. So the, the panel of uh, today is going to be fairly interesting because it's taking an angle that is a bit original compared to many of the discussion we probably had the whole day. We are going to look at, um, let's say, a therapeutic area or a general indication that is unusual for what has been the focus of cell engine technologies up to date. But I personally find it uh, particularly interesting because it's fundamentally pushing the frontier to what would be the next areas of focus that the public could come attend as soon as um, the technology consolidates. So we will look at the and discuss about the advancements of cell therapy for autoimmune diseases. We always think when uh, we think about uh, cell and gene technologies, about oncology, we always think about rare diseases. But if you think about the very significant unmet need that does exist in those uh, uh, immunotherapies, for autoimmune especially, and the very strong potential that uh, cell and gene unlocks, uh, it's actually an area that could be extremely big and material, both in terms of patients and met need, but also in terms of uh, market potential. So as the overall industry and the therapies approaches and progress in aspects of uh, safety, the efficacy of this approach can be really transformational in solving significant unmet needs like uh, related to lupus or other very bad diseases that are consuming the life of many patients. <coughs> and so this will be the topic of today's panel. I'm very happy to have uh, the speakers that we have on the stage, but I would prefer to let them introduce themselves than me attempting anything close to a proper presentation. So please, why don't uh, you introduce yourselves? Okay. Should we start? Sure. Thank you, Alberto. I'm Tracy Lodi, so I'm the CSO of um, Qual Therapeutics. Um, do, you, do you want us to introduce the company first, too? Yeah. Yourself sure. probably, and the company. Probably, probably be helpful. Um, Qual Therapeutics, um, some of you may or may not have heard of us. We're based in London. I myself personally uh, based in Boston and have been told that it's obvious that I'm based in Boston, but, uh, but the company is based in um, in London, so fly over there uh, frequently. And we are developing um, next-gen therapies for CAR Tregs. So it's um, a regulatory cell that really in most cases is dysregulated in patients that have autoimmune disease. And unlike effector cells that uh, Alberto was introducing and in, in for oncology for T effector cells, um, that actually are able to kill and attack you know, the, the immune cell, these cells really function to dampen down an immune response, and that's an important um, distinction. So we're taking advantage of that and the ability of the cells to be acquired, similarly to CAR-Ts, out of the patient apheresis material. We engineer them with a CAR, similarly, chimeric antigen receptor, and we're using that CAR to actually the same as a CAR T, but really go to different sites of the body where there's inflammation and autoimmunity going on. And in the case of Quell, which I'll go into in a moment, our first indication is actually in transplant. So we're looking to deliver the cells with a CAR that will specifically home um, the cells to the liver um, by virtual of an HLA mismatch in which the patients will have gotten an A2 donor liver graft, be A2 negative, we then take their cells, engineer them with an A2 car, so when we put them in, the only place in the body where those cells will see A2 is in the liver. And the hope is that the cells will go there and provide a localized immune tolerance and immune suppression, and then we slowly wean these patients off immunosuppression and hopefully get to immune tolerance. So it's one way that we're using T regulatory cells in order to break the um, alloreactivity barrier. Then our next programs, which are preclinical, um, are more in the you know, canonical autoimmune stages and diseases. And our first program that's most advanced there is for type 1 diabetes, in which we're directing the cells to the pancreas. And then we also have a program with um, AstraZeneca. Both of these are partnered with AstraZeneca for inflammatory bowel disease in which we're directing the cells by virtue of a car to a target in order to get to inflammation in the gut. 
and then eventually all of these um, are autologous programs at first, and we can discuss the you know, virtues of autologous versus <coughs> allo, and then eventually we're going into and developing a, a stem cell therapy um, from an iPSC-derived cell um, for, to get to an allogeneic um, Treg. So um, right now we're in the clinic, really exciting um, area for Quell, and you know, really happy to be part of this um, panel. So I'll turn it over to you, sure. Christy. Great job. Uh, so I, I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Alberta, for, for guiding us through the panel. Uh, so I'm Christy Jones. I'm the CEO of Neximmune. Neximmune is a company that's based in, in Maryland. Uh, it is a clinical stage company. Uh, like most everyone here, we sort of all started in oncology for the most part. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where this platform technology has started. Let me just take a moment to explain a bit about what we're doing. So um, Neximmune is basically uh, focused on driving antigen-specific cell-mediated responses. There's a couple of different ways we do it, but foundational to any modality that we're using is a nanoparticle technology that uses natural signaling biology. So if you are familiar with the dendritic cell systems, you can think of it as your own uh, personally designed synthetic dendritic cell. So we use nanoparticle technology, we conjugate the signals, and that allows us to go directly to antigen-specific T cells and direct their function. So in the case of oncology, which is where we started, this is about going in, engaging these specific antigen T cells, and then expanding those T cells in multiple populations that can go in and obviously uh, uh, kill cancer cells. Um, but interestingly, now we're sort of switching out this the other, the other way. So now it's antigen presentation, but what we want to deliver now is a different a signal. So either to inhibit or to delete these autoreactive antigen-specific cells. So uh, what we're doing, and the way you can kind of think about the modalities and how they play out, is this nanoparticle is used in our cell therapy manufacturing process. We use this to enrich and expand cells for our, uh, our cell therapy and oncology. But the same nanoparticle could be used as an in vivo way to do the same thing. So you could think about the fact that you could actually expand your cells inside the patient, or alternatively, you could delete those cells inside the patient. So, so that's kind of the basic premise and foundation of, of what we're doing. We started, as I mentioned, on the oncology side, but now you know, I know today we're focusing mostly on immunology. Uh, we are doing so, we're not yet in the clinic, but we have some ongoing efforts with Yale and with the NIH and MS. Also, HAM-TSP, which is a uh, myelopathy that is caused by an autoimmune reaction. Also in type 1 diabetes. Uh, so we've got a number of programs kind of moving along quickly. What I find quite interesting is really be able to reach out into experts in the field to bring them in to help develop these sort of novel approaches, whether it's a cell therapy approach or whether we are using kind of the injectable format. And then lastly, uh, from a cell therapy side, we've, we've looked at and started to develop ways to drive T regulatory responses. All that to be said is it's important to line up, as we talk about autoimmune diseases, important to line up the biology of what's happening in a particular disease area of interest, and then with that, choose the ideal kind of therapeutic modality. I think what's been really exciting for us is this sort of transition from a lot of targets are really well, well known, well described in oncology, and it's building so quickly in autoimmune diseases. That is really gonna unlock so much potential <laughs> to go into so many diseases like celiac, RA, lupus, you know, and, and you know, I think as Alberta mentioned, you know, 24 million patients in, across 80 diseases are sort of suffering from, from, uh, from this kind of disability damage progressive disorder. That, that still results ultimately in, in, in death for, for patients. So really excited to be here. Well, Christy, Tracy, thank you. I'm humbled, kind of just <laughs> listening to the introduction. I could say that I have a lot to learn on the science and on the <laughs> biology here, and so we'll take advantage of that. But building on the concept, if you think about what, for instance, Humira has been in the market as a drug and as a potential, it's not unlikely to see that once we establish a cell engine technology as a firm modality, that is just going to be the nat natural next frontier about what we will be doing. So let's play a game, contrast and compare. <laughs> so if we contrast and compare immunology and oncology in CGT, how 
would this look like? What are the things that come uh, to your mind? Maybe let's start from your side and then we evolve uh, toward this side. Sure, sure, and, and, and I think it's a great place to start. Um, I, I had the privilege of being at a, a small cell therapy um, last month, also in, in California, and um, brought together all of the oncology CAR-T companies and, and give their experience real from as you mentioned, Christy, like target identification and cancer through manufacturing and then into the clinic. And I think now when we come either with a different cell modality or even taking those cell modality and trying to really stand on the shoulders of everything that they've learned in terms of manufacturing, in terms of getting the cells from the patient, the delivery and um, the, the dosing and really the safety. And I think the, the first thing that comes to mind um, when you're talking about autoimmunity and depending on which disease you're talking about, the patient population is very different. Um, it's still an autologous therapy, so we really thought very hard as to, you know, how can we go in and get proof of concept, both safety and efficacy, and then in a stepwise fashion, go into more and more risky, I guess, for lack of a better term, indication in which patients could be younger. Patients have chronic diseases and you have to think about treating them for their entire life. Because when you consider a type one diabetic, most of these patients exhibit the disease um, when they're juveniles. And, and they're really dealing with this for their entire life. And of course you mentioned there's Humira for IBD and some of these, but it, and there's insulin for type one diabetic patients. And, and recently, um, after about 25 years in, in, in development, I worked on a little bit of this, um, finally we have a monoclonal antibody, anti-CD3, teplizumab, which has been approved for the pre-diabetic stage to prevent that, but really there's nothing out there to be disease modifying when these children become diabetic. So that's basically they're on insulin for lifelong and they're not doing anything to stop that pathology. So all of the drugs that are there are really just treating the, the symptoms. They're not halting the disease. And so when we think of cell therapies, we're hoping that we can have a disease modifying approach. And the one difference is that we really need to be safer. They are children or they are other older patients, then potentially they will need chronic delivery, right? So safety is a big thing. And you know, we're probably one of only two companies that have actually treated a patient with an engineered um, T-reg. So we thought to ourselves, what is the best indication in which we can go into and ask some very key questions? What is it going to do to alloreactivity, which is why we went into transplant? Can we actually have access to that tissue, which is why we went into liver? Because it's, it's readily available that you can multiple biopsy liver transplant patients. So really the important things for Quell is, is, is foundation and moving forward with Tregs is can we manufacture the cells? Can we manufacture the cells from, from transplant patients that have been on lifeline uh, long immunosuppressant drugs? And the answer to that is yes. It, sometimes it's difficult as it is with oncology patients. But we can you know, get them out, expand them in culture, and deliver them to, to a dose um, ranging in which we, we hope will be efficacious. And the second question is, can we track those cells in the blood for sure? Can we track those cells in the tissue, which is in, hasn't been done in autoimmunity? Sure, in cancer, you can biopsy the cancer and you take liquid tumor biopsies, but really in autoimmunity, it's very difficult. You're, you're not gonna biopsy a pancreas from a type one patient. Um, so we asked ourselves, where can we go? And so in the liver, we can biopsy. So our hope is that we can then take serial biopsies after delivery and actually detect the cells in the liver and then also see what it's doing to the uh, local immunology cells there and actually changing that phenotype. And then the next big question, and I think this is what we've really learned from the CAR-T field, and I'm sure, Christy, you know, being an oncology, you can comment on this. How long are these cells gonna persist how long are they going to maintain their phenotype, and how long do we need them to persist? Because unlike effector cells, in which we've learned they're there, they get in, they, they kill the tumor, depending on how strong that response is, there is sometimes a, a very bad safety reaction with the patient with CRS. This doesn't happen with T regulatory cells, because again, they're just dampening down the immune system. But we really don't know how long we need those cells to persist, to maintain that tolerance, because 
they have what's called infectious tolerance in, in, in which they will spread other immune cells and convert other immune cells to dampen down the immune system too. So we're really trying to answer these fundamental questions with our transplant study and then move from there into autoimmunity and really take with us the lessons that we've learned in terms of manufacturing and delivery of the cells, the safety of the cells, how long the cells persist, what their phenotype is, and looking for some biomarkers, and take that into the next indication with, with autoimmunity. And, I, and then I think we'll have a sense of the dose and the, and the timing fr from that. And we've learned a lot from <coughs> CAR-T, and, and I will say a, a higher dose is not always better. It's really better to have a good phenotype of your cells when you're, when you're manufacturing that. And so these are some of the things that we thought about in, with entering transplant first before going into the other autoimmune diseases. And I'll answer more about the other autoimmune diseases, but I want to give you a chance sure. to comment. Yeah. yeah, maybe I'll just pick up on the importance of the cell phenotype, right? So I think, again, kind of learning from oncology, you know, here we're trying to generate a T cell product that includes T stem cell uh, populations uh, but as well as T central and T effector memory populations. All of this is to drive anti tumor activity, but also to establish immunologic memory or reestablish surveillance, right, so for, for durability. But now we're kind of trying to do the opposite thing, right? So that's it's to try to drive more T cells into the tumor with that kind of phenotype. And, and really, that, that's really designed to break tolerance. But to establish tolerance, now you think about, and I'll just maybe use type 1 diabetes as an example, there are a couple of nature publications that were put out uh, over the last couple of years <clears throat> that describe this T stem cell population, which we're actually trying to drive in oncology, sits in the, uh, the draining uh, lymph node of the pancreas, right? And it's almost like a cancer stem cell, right? It repopulates these bad-acting autoreactive <laughs> T cells that ultimately get down into the organs and drive damage. And that if you eliminate those effector cells uh, from the pancreas, you actually aren't going to truly impact the disease itself. Right? You need to get at these T stem cells. So one is we're trying to drive them, and I think we've learned a lot on how to do that in oncology. Now we're trying to, to how do we think about getting rid of or suppressing these, these kind of uh, T stem cell populations that are perpetuating the disease. But then, you know, I think that Tracy did, did a beautiful job of laying this out. In oncology, it's high mortality, it's speed, it's, it's go hard, go fast, hit at multiple points. But for autoimmune disease, once you start to get, and once you've gone through sort of your initial diagnosis, it's this long progressive, you know, um, disease that causes organ destruction, damage, and ultimately to, to death. And once you have organ damage, you know, think about some of these, you know, I, I, I worked on some of these. Um, these current therapies that are immunosuppressant, you cannot, you, you might slow the progression of the disease. You might even be able to declare that you've halted the disease, but you can't reverse it. And certainly if there's organ damage, there's no way really to pull that back. So going early is important. And yet here we are in a, in a patient population that we're gonna need to get in early to halt and eliminate those cells, get ahead of epitope spread instead of driving it, and so the safety, pro, the safety bar is high. And I think that's why we're all picking you know, in, indications to start with, really high unmet need, high disease burden, uh, diseases where we can get an earlier read, we can track these cells in, into patients, and then from there sort of lift on and continue to expand. I think there's so much that we have translated from oncology. All of us are using our manufacturing experience to move that over. I think there's a lot to be learned from development. And then I'll just point to, and a nod to the panel that was just before us, uh, some of the challenges in terms of reimbursement and access. You know, from that perspective, there's a lot more patients, and they're not all gonna be available. You know, they can't always get into hospitals you know, for treatments. So we have to be thinking about how we do things that maybe are a bit more off the shelf, and yet preserve this important safety feature. So I think this is for us, how we think about both the cell therapy as our taking our lead program into things like MS, but also that injectable, as we think about an off-the-shelf way to drive this T-cell, cell-mediated response in patients, and that you know, potentially could help us access, uh, access a broader population. So you know, we're really excited. I think there's a lot to be done here, and you know, a lot of experts you know, to, to take advantage of and, le and leverage. So if we're picking your brain in the hallways, you know, you'll know what we're doing. Wonderful. 
very good perspective on science and approaches. And what if I push a little bit to comment on different clinical trial design? How would you go about it? Because it's probably very different, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe I'll start on a, sure. a couple of things. I know you're in the clinic, so you're going to be able to give some real world you know, uh, experience. So we've been working with uh, folks you know, in, in each of the therapeutic areas of interest, like MS, type 1 diabetes. We're starting to think about celiac disease. You know, how do we reach out? And it's a little bit different than oncology because I think the endpoints are a bit more clear, although we, we can certainly be better. Um, in, in autoimmune diseases, the endpoints may or may not be relevant to cell therapy. So to be thinking about how do we select a patient population, how does the biology match to the disease, and then how do we design a study that can truly characterize the benefit that's truly disease modifying, not just symptom improvement. How do we actually reduce or, in fact, eliminate the need for immunosuppressive agents, which is one of the things we'd really love to do. Uh, but these trials are also uh, can be longer, and in some cases over time may be larger. So indication selection is going to be incredibly important uh, as we go into this, and how we're going to have to really think about dosing and how we, go, how we actually do dose escalation studies. Again, in oncology, go high, go fast, combine. It's everything to kill the tumor. But in this case, it's a much more staged, I'm sorry, staged methodical approach, but doesn't mean we can't move quickly. And certainly there's opportunity for breakthrough and breakthrough treatments, breakthrough designations in the autoimmune space. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for us. But. Yeah, great. And um, I'll, I'll just pick up on, on, on one aspect of the, of the patients and how we're thinking about it in terms of transplant. And as you said exactly, for oncology, it's all about speed and can we get the cells and manufacture the cells and get it back to the patient so they're still stable and the disease hasn't progressed to a point where it's life-threatening and, and they can no longer be treated. In the transplant situation in which we design the trial, um, there's two distinct differences. That's, that's not the case. We, we actually, in particular, picked stable patients. So these liver transplant patients are one to five years post their transplant. So they're already pretty stable. They're not in, in the point where the immune system is all jacked up and they've just received their transplant and their heavy doses of med. So they're on a stable transplant. And um, so that being said, we have time to manufacture the cell. The patient is on their immunosuppressive therapy. So when we take their apheresis product and manufacture it, we have time from vein, vein to vein, you know, four to six weeks to, you know, to get the cells, engineer the cells, manufacture the cells, do the QC and the release, because we can time the patients as to when we withdraw their immunosuppression and then deliver. So this is a luxury that we have that is not necessarily the case, is not the case in oncology for one, but moving into autoimmunity, um, maybe necessarily also not being the case that we'll have this luxury of time. So we're taking what we learn now from the liver transplant patients and how we see the cells expand and doing some process improvements to our cells to get a better, purer population, can seed smaller amount of cells to get to a good cell dose, taking all these learnings and going into autoimmunity, because obviously, as you pointed out, Christy, you want to treat that patient as early as possible before the antigen has spread, before, in the case of type 1 diabetes, before all of the beta cells are destroyed, because if you no, we're just treating the immune aspect of it. We're not doing anything to regenerate the pancreas and regenerating destroyed islets there. So if they're already destroyed, as you just pointed out, that we, we can't regenerate that, at least not with an immune cell therapy. So the goal is then to go in as early as possible. So we need to have our manufacturing down and learn from our dose and have a pretty good idea of the safety and where we want to intervene um, in type one, and right now, there's really not great biomarkers, right? We, we will intervene here in which patients have a residual amount of C-peptide, which means they have some beta cells left. There are so, so many you know, month, weeks to months post-diagnosis, and they're not going under you know, unstable hypo and hyperglycemic events but arguably the regulators, and we can talk about that later, will make us go in because it's a new modality and as juvenile, we'll go into a higher age population for safety. 
which may or may not you know, really be translatable to a really early aggressive part of the disease, what we'll, we'll see. That's probably what will happen. But we're looking just to learn from the manufacturing and then see that we can do as quick as possible, as safely as possible to get into it early and possible to intervene in other autoimmune areas. So Tracy, can we say that um, using CAR-T to kill all the B cell is the magic reset button or? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. Um, and it's, it's another learning for the autoimmune um, space is, is most in the audience, if you're not aware, a lot of the CAR-Ts now to CD19 are being used to treat um, autoimmunity. And there's been success actually in lupus, pemphigus, some scleroderma, and you know, a handful of academic studies in, in some companies going in in, in this area. And, um, and, it's, and it's amazing you know, the remission that at least the lupus patients have mm -hmm. gone into here. But what I like in this too is taking a sledgehammer and effect and wiping out all of your B cells so then therefore there's no more autoimmunity and, and remission has lasted like out to a year in some of these patients, so which is fantastic. There really hasn't been any safety issues to see as of date, but it remains to be seen what will happen to these patients you know, over the course of the coming years when they need to respond to antigens and infection and flu and COVID and you need to mount an antibody response, right? <laughs> so so the, you, you do need to mount, be able to mount an antibody response to fight off infection. So this is the downside of treating with a CD19 CAR T for autoimmunity. On the flip side, if you take a Treg and even if you use a, a CD19 Treg, which hasn't been done only um, preclinically to show that it prevents you know, GVHD, so the data is out there that you can have an effect on B cell related um, mechanisms, you potentially won't be killing the cell and you won't be hitting it with that sledgehammer. So again, you know, we hope to take the learnings of taking the CAR T's and then take a more targeted, safer approach to target that B cell because clinically it's efficacious, right? And then to do something um, more, more targeted. I would just maybe add to that, you know, from the, if you think about, I think B cells play such an important role, that's pretty well understood. I think there's a lot to be leveraged from that, and kind of thinking also uh, adjacent to that is the T cell, and role of T cell in, you know, just in the biology of autoimmune diseases. And I think, you know, as we talked about, is getting ahead of the epitope spread is really important, but with that said, even these early patients, whether it's type 1 diabetes or other autoimmune diseases, may in fact, in fact, will have more than one target, uh, one antigen is driving that autoreactive sort of autoimmunity you know, effect. And so the ability to go after multiple targets simultaneously, just like we do in, in the oncology space, can also play a role in addressing, you know, getting at all of these targets early. I think in some diseases, that's where the target identification has right. become so critical. And I think we was at a, a recent meeting where just poster after poster, we're talking about uh, different targets here being, you know, antigen targets for pre presenting and actually doing this in the autoimmune space. So I think there's so much to do to leverage all the te different technologies, you know, whether single target, whether B cell or T cell is, how do we line up that biology to each of these indications to kind of drive benefit for these patients? Thank you very much. Well, last question, then we'll go a little bit more in the area that I'm more passionate about, CMCM manufacturing, and by the way, <laughs> regulatory too, that we shouldn't forget. So if you have to take a, a step and look forward, what would be the most important hurdle that you would look forward to overcome? CMC, manufacturing, and regulatory. I don't know, Tracy? <laughs> Probably all of the above, right? Um, I, I, will, I will point out one fundamental difference between the Treg manufacturing and CAR-T is that we start with billions of cells in a leukophoresis and then sort down to a really naive, pure population of Tregs. So what we're actually engineering with a lentiviral-based construct that puts in the CAR, our phenotype lock, and then what other modulators we need. Um, we're doing that on a small number of cells, on the millions. So the one advantage of doing that is it, it's less costly for the GMP viral reagents than for CAR-Ts that are doing this on a large amount of cells. The one disadvantage of this is that we're sorting down 
to a naive population, so we're not always going to be able to expand enough to make that dose for the patient. And so there always needs to be some improvement in here from lack of cell loss with the sorting, better antibody reagents, better stimulating reagents, um, shorter expansion time if we can do that because we're really just expanding up to get to a cell number at the end. And if we could shorten that and we don't need that amount of cells, then we could maybe only expand for a week, right? And, and everything that I hear from the CAR-T, and I think this will hold true, at least it does in animal studies, that it's really the phenotype that's important. So you don't want to give a billion cells that have been expanded for so long and exhausted and not going to be able to do anything in the patient rather than give, you know, 500 million cells that are able going to be expand and really function. So I, I think the purity and the potency and the phenotype are key. Getting the cost of goods down is key. Getting the time, you know, to manufacturing down is key. And um, maybe we could use your help on this, Alberto, really getting the whole system closed <laughs> so there's less <laughs> manual labor. Look You're, at Cocoon. Yeah. <laughs> And, and um, so I think there's, uh, you know, the manufacturing process is in its infancy. Have we generated, you know, um, GMP material over and over from patient material that can pass CTA and other, you know, regulatory um, agencies in Europe? Yes. But is it by far the one that we're going to commercialize with? No. So I think across all cell therapies, and this is common in other meetings that I've gone to, is that we really need to be able to shorten the time of expansion, decrease the cost of goods, and we'll really then be able to bring that to like more patients. Yeah, maybe I'll just add, I, I, I totally agree and completely passionate about manufacturing. I think there's a lot to, to learn from that, and I think you described it beautifully. Um, so maybe I'll just pick up on the regulatory side. I think there's, you know, obviously, the, the agency is working very hard with, with all of us on regenerative medicine, and I think there is an opportunity to continue to, to have a, a very good partnership. Nonetheless, the hurdles, you know, going into the clinic, through the clinic, and I think more late-stage development when you're starting to go after a label is, is going to be something we'll have to really think about. How are we going to be able to execute and operationalize that? I think that goes back to picking a, a very high-end, met-need, heavy-burden patient population like transplant and type 1 diabetes, uh, certain, uh, you know, like this, these myelopathies that we're, we're looking at, um, th those are going to help us, I think, craft the path, right? And I love that the, you know, type 1 diabetes path itself is now established. I think a lot of other uh, autoimmune indications they are, just have to figure out how to, how to, how to manage that, you know, uh, for cell therapy. So I think we've had some, we've had some good early engagement. Um, we're really excited about it, but at the same time, eyes wide open. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, in general, I would like to make a more philosophical comment. If you think about cell and gene technologies can be that uh, fine scalpel that allow us uh, to manage all the immune system in the body. And we, have, uh, we are starting to learn pretty well how to use it to activate the immune system and to fight forward the things that before we were not able to fight. But it's also very much the case we can think about using it for down-regulating and managing down overreaction. So I guess that we are probably at the infancy of an era in which we will become the master of our immunity. And this, if you look forward, is just extremely exciting, per se. Beside the fact that if you go really in uh, autoimmune diseases, the volume of manufacturing will be pretty big. <laughs> Number of patients will go up ex exponentially. Significantly. Yeah, and so. uh, as we said, uh, the Humira is probably the largest blockbuster that has been uh, out there. So it's an area of uh, definitely big interest. But I want to thank you very much, especially from the scientific standpoint. I've learned quite a lot. So thank you for your contribution. And uh, hopefully this was interesting for all of you. Thank you.